just a small or a brief introduction, uh, which it can be of uh, 93 years long life uh, of a person. Uh, so today our guest who is Desmond Morris, uh, he is a zoologist, a writer, an artist and a mentor today with us. He is 93 years old, but still he doesn't have a, a word stop in his di uh, dictionary. Uh, which is fantastic. His energy is a no match even. So interestingly, I am 31 years old, but still I can't uh, think of that sort of energy, uh, which you have. So I welcome you all. Uh, and I welcome Desmond Morris for today's session. I'm very pleased to be here. Fantastic. So, um, I mean, of course, uh, so the, the title of uh, today's session is The Artistic Ape, uh, which of course we'll explore, but to, to, become, a, to become an artist or to become a, a scientist, I think that that journey, it starts from, from the childhood. So how was uh, for you growing up, growing up during, uh, <laughs> especially those tragic moments at the beginning of your, uh, of your life, World War II was there. Um, so, so how was it uh, during those times? Yes, I was a, a teenager uh, during World War II. And so for me, it was a very strange time because here was I just starting out on life and all the grown-ups, all the adults, all they wanted to do was to kill one another. So I thought this was uh, rather awful. I, I thought, well, it's gone mad. The, the, the human species has gone mad. Uh, in a, an essay I, which my mother kept that I wrote when I was a schoolboy uh, during World War II, I described the human species uh, as a monkey with a diseased brain. That's actually written in my school essay when I was about 12, 13. And this is because uh, when you're at that age, you're full of optimism and excitement about the future. Uh, and for a teenager to be faced with nothing but uh, killing is, is really uh, a daunting prospect. I mean, I, you know, we were being bombed. I think over a hundred bombs fell near me, uh, my, near my home. Um, and uh, I decided that I had to become a rebel. I had to rebel against the madness of the adult population. <laughs> so as a teenager, at first, of course, I couldn't, I couldn't put this into words. But as I got a little older, got in my later teens, I started to articulate this, I started to express it. And I said, my problem is that although I want to rebel against the uh, establishment, against authority, against the society that is wrapped up with killing and murder. Um, I, I can't be a negative, a destructive rebel because I've had a loving childhood. I've had a very loving childhood. And so for me, it had to be a constructive rebellion. It couldn't be negative. I couldn't go around smashing windows, you know. Um, it had to be something positive. And I was lucky because at that time uh, at school, I found a book in which I discovered the Surrealists' uh, paintings. And so I started to become, uh, even in, when I was very young, while I was at school, I started to make Surrealist images because the Surrealists were a, a group of artists who had rebelled. In their case, they rebelled against the horrors of World War I because surrealism began in the late 20s uh, when people had said, you know, the horrors of the trenches of World War I are so appalling that society is sick and we will, we will rebel against it. And so I, there was I in World War II feeling a sympathy with uh, the surrealists. So I started to become a surrealist artist. That was one positive form of escape. And the other one was to turn my back on human beings and turn towards 
the animal world and I became a zoologist and spent all my time looking down the microscope, uh, studying um, microscopic life, uh, going out in, and studying birds and fish and, and reptiles and amphibians and studying animal behavior. So two passions developed when I was at school. One was surrealist painting and the other was animal behavior. And those are the two passions that have stayed with me now uh, from the age of 14 to the age of 93. Quite a long time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely amazing. Well, I have uh, one of the proofs of your two passions uh, here with me. Um, it's an amazing book by uh, Desmond. Uh, he has written, basically he has combined both art and science here. Uh, to show uh, when these two fields, they come together, uh, what it can bring out uh, to, in terms of, so this book is about explaining body languages and postures. Um, but, but my question is that, uh, what are the similarities between an artist and a scientist? Um, well, they're both explorers. Right? They're both exploring uh, new ideas but the method is different. Um, the scientific method is analysis uh, and, the sign, and the artistic method is intuition. Uh, now, it, most people spend their lives either analyzing things or being intuitive. If you're a poet, you're, you're in, intuitive. If, if you're an accountant, you're analyzing. Um, and we have two hemispheres in our brain and there's a slight specialization uh, in those hemispheres. One hemisphere is more specialized for analysis and the other for intuition. And so I've been lucky because I've been able to use both hemispheres, whereas most people focus more. An accountant would use one hemisphere of his brain much more than the other. And a poet would use the other hemisphere more, uh, but I've used both. and. What happens is that in the scientific method, what you're trying to do as a scientist, and this is the basis of science, is to take something extremely complicated and try to make it simple, try to understand it. So the scientist is simplifying the complex. The artist is doing the exact opposite. The artist starts out with a few tubes of paint and a brush. And with that, he makes the Mona Lisa. Uh, and the point about the artist is that uh, he is taking something very simple, just a few tubes of paint or pencil. And with that very simple beginning, he is making something incredibly complicated because the greatest works of art are the most subtle and complex things that human beings ever produce. So there you have the two different mental processes, uh, one making simple things from complex and the other making complex things from simple. Those are the, that's science and art. They're completely different mental processes, but they both involve, they do have in common one very important thing, which is the need to explore. Uh, and not just to sit back and watch a uh, look at the sunset. Uh, the, the important thing is to keep asking questions. And uh, I've never stopped asking questions. I, every day there's something that puzzles me that I, I, can't, I can't work it out and I want to find out the answer to it. Uh, so every day I, I'm facing new challenges. And if, if there aren't any around, I invent them. I make, I make myself explore every day. I try to do something new and different every day, which is why my brain is still working at 93. I wish my body would keep up with it. <laughs> my body is getting old, but my brain is still uh, uh, young in, in, the sen in the sense that uh, it keeps, I have the mental energy to go on asking questions and exploring new ideas. Yeah, uh, we will for sure uh, today explore, you know, your both uh, the, the parts of your brain, uh, 
for sure a scientist's brain and also uh, an artist's brain. And also, uh, I think this would be our take home, one of the take home messages, messages from this discussion that um, a, a scientist makes, uh, takes complex things, but makes it simpler. But an artist takes simple things, make it complex, but, be, but both of them, they explore. That's, that's, uh, that's exactly. To, to start your scientific journey, uh, basically uh, your first famous book, which I have here, Kindle version of it. I don't know. <laughs> so <laughs> starting from, you know, that typewriter. So I think that the first time when you uh, wrote this draft, 1969, it was uh, 52 years before. Uh, where basically you wrote it on on a typewriter and then now coming to this technology where I have it and I read it in a Kindle, uh, <laughs> this like ebook reader uh, kind of thing. So just to start with how, uh, what is, how do you describe a naked ape? Who is a naked ape? I am the naked ape, you are the naked ape. <laughs> um, what I... <laughs> What happened was this, it's very, very simple. Um, I had been overworking. I, uh, my, my problem all my life has been that I'm a workaholic. I love, I love being busy and doing things. And, and sometimes I pushed it too far. You know, I've done too much because there's so much I want to do. Uh, and in the 1960s, I was pushing myself much too far. I had a, a, a a staff of 80. I was a curator looking after uh, mammals at London Zoo. I also was writing books. I was doing book reviews. I was doing radio broadcasts. I had a one hour television show every fortnight and a half hour television show every week. All of that was going on. It was too much. And what happened was that um, my the only time in my life my health collapsed and I was uh, in bed for a month or so just totally w worn out and while I was lying there I thought I'm not a machine after all I'm an animal I'm 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 vulnerable and it was in that moment of, of collapse when I, my health had collapsed through overwork uh, instead I must say it wasn't uh, I wasn't being pushed to overwork it was me I was the one who's uh, blamed for it uh, I just loved everything I was doing and I wanted to do it all. And of course you can't do everything. <laughs> uh, and, and so what happened was that when I recovered and was back at work again, I said, right, I'm going to reduce or uh, make my life simpler. I'm going to cut out this and cut out that and cut out the other. And I reduced a lot of the things that I was doing so my life was less stressful. And I thought, I have really got to look at the human species, uh, look at myself as, as a human animal and try to decide what kind of animal am I? Uh, and so I, I took a month off. I could only take a month off. It was November in 1966. And I took a month off. You said 1969, but that was the human zoo. That was another book. But the first book was Naked Ape, and that I wrote it in November of 1966. And I only had four weeks in which to write the whole book. Uh, so I was typing very fast. Uh, I'm, uh, I am, I'm, I'm lucky because my father used to be, uh, used to write stories when, when I was a small boy. And so I was given a typewriter when I was very, yeah, very tiny. Uh, it was said in my family that I could type before I could write. And so I've always been able to type faster than the keys will accept my fingers. It, it's, it's annoying that I, I can't, you know, I type so fast. Uh, and I've done that since I was, I don't know, uh, five years old, I think I was typing. And so I sat down at my typewriter, which actually was my father's typewriter. He died and I I'd inherited his typewriter and I sat down at it at my desk and I wrote an entire book in four weeks, just nonstop. Uh, and at the end of it all, I, I, I didn't have a carbon copy of it. Um, I just wrote it uh, and I put it in an envelope, I put it in the folder and I gave it to my publisher and I said, here you are, this is the book you wanted. He'd been 
asking me to write this book for some years. And I'd always thought, no, 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 I can't. It's too, I'm a zoologist. I can't pay, I can't do that. But then I, I thought, what the heck, I'm going to do it. So I wrote the book, handed it to him at Christmas, and he said, thank you, uh, and he put it on a shelf, and that was that. And I didn't think any more about it. And then uh, after Christmas, he rang me up and he said, this book is, is going to be a bestseller. And I said, uh, don't be silly, of course not, no, no, no. And I, at this particular point uh, in my life, people said I did this to write, I, I deliberately set out to write a shocking bestseller. It wasn't true because um, at the end of the year, in 1967, I took on a new job. I moved from the zoo to become director of the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. I moved to the art world to become a director of an art gallery, an art institute. And so I was just settling into my new job when uh, I kept getting messages from my publisher saying, we've got a, an American edition, we've got a, a French edition, and so on. It went on and on. Um, and, and then he rang me up one day and said, we've just sold the film rights. And I thought, well, at that point, I started to believe that it was going to be a success. And of course, um, you know, when you do something, when you write something like that, it was written from the heart, it was written with intensity, it was written with belief. And I set out to be totally honest about what I felt human beings were really all about. And I wrote it in simple language. Uh, I left out all technical stuff. I removed all jargon. Because most people who have written about human behavior, they're anthropologists, psychiatrists, psychiatrists, or, or psychologists or uh, sociologists, they, they can't get rid of their jargon. They, one of the great problems of being an academic is that you're taught to use jargon, complicated technology. If, it, if there's a complicated word, you use it rather than a simple word just to show off to your colleagues. And I had, of course, done this. I'd been, I'd written a lot of scientific papers. I'd been, a, I was an academic. Uh, for a number of years in Oxford. And then, then I moved to television. And when I went into television, they, they said to me, you can't use those words anymore. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but I'm a scientist. I, 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 I've, got to, I've got to use all these, no, 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 you can't use any technical terms. So I had to then develop something which I have almost uh, embossed on my brain, which is, simplification without distortion. Those three words were key to me. I, I had to simplify, but without distorting. And that's not easy. Um, writing scientific publications, academic, is much easier, much easier than writing accurate popular science. Um, the academics look down on popular science. Oh, well, it's just popular science. But the fact is that if you're going to be accurate and honest, to do that in simple language is extremely difficult. And every word has to be exactly right. So that was what I was, I was trained in television because I'd made several hundred programs by 67. And I, I, I was trained in television to use simple language so that people could understand me. So when I applied that to writing a scientific book, my colleagues are horrified. And, oh, oh, shocking, you can't do this, you can't do this. You know, um, uh, you, there are no references. I said, no, no, this is, this is just to be read. It's not, not, this is, I'm not showing off my academic skill. I'm trying to communicate something. I'm trying to tell people what the human species is like. And in order to do that, I'm going to use a new term. I'm going to call people naked apes because we are primates. We're related to apes, but we don't have a thick coat of fur. So I'm going to call us naked. I'm going to pretend I'm an alien landing on the planet and looking around saying, what's this strange ape that has no hair, has no, uh, has no fur? Uh, and so I wrote this book, looking at humans in this new way. And to my complete astonishment, uh, it took off and was published, I think, you know, 40, 
languages uh, and sold over 12 million copies. I've lo that was long ago. I can't remember how many it sold now. Uh, and this is all over half a century ago, by the way. <laughs> this is 1967. And I, uh, when I finished it, um, my publisher said, well, it's changed your life. Because, of course, I'd never had any money. I'd always been broke. Uh, whatever little money I earned, I would spend immediately. <laughs> uh, I, I'm a great, I love collecting strange objects. Uh, and, and if I had any money, I'd go out and buy a strange African mask or something like that. <laughs> but but um, uh, suddenly I had all this money. And I said to my mother, who, who was uh, very, obviously very pleased at my success, she, she said, you must save it, dear, you must save it. I said, don't think so. I think I'll spend it. And I did. It took me five years. It was so much of it. It took me five years to spend it. But those five years were wonderful because what I was able to do during those five years was to go off and paint. I, I bought a, a large house in, in the Mediterranean and I went off and I painted at a big studio there and uh, let my art take over for those five years. I also wrote some more books. Uh, I write a, a book each winter. Uh, but um, at the end of that time, I'd, I'd used up all the money. I'd had a wonderful time. Uh, and I went back to university, I went back to Oxford, and went back to work again and started work on a project which was a new subject because I was now a zoologist studying human beings, which is quite unusual. As I said, most all study, all scientific studies are done by anthropologists or sociologists or psychiatrists or psychologists. Zoologists are not supposed to poke their nose into human affairs. They're supposed to stick with, with beetles and, and uh, chameleons and so on. But I was looking at humans as a zoologist, looking at uh, the human rights. So, and the first thing I noticed was that, um, although we had dictionaries of words, we didn't have dictionaries of actions, of gestures, of postures, of movements. And so I started studying this and I made a, uh, this was, while I was still in the Mediterranean, I began this study. Because living in, in Malta, in the, in the island of Malta, I noticed that the body language uh, was slightly different. Now, it wasn't called body language then. Nobody, it wasn't called anything. Uh, people didn't study gestures uh, uh, or postures or movements or actions. Uh, that, that was something that had yet to be studied. And so I started a major study and my, <clears throat> my aim was to analyze and describe every known human action. Uh, and I started collecting them and I got to about 3000, I think when uh, I, had, I moved back to Oxford and I went back to Oxford where I continued this study. And in, in 1977, 10 years after the Naked Ape, uh, the book Man Watching was published. And this was the first book which had really analyzed body language in any detail today. Everybody talks about body language uh, without, you say, oh yes, it's look, at, look at their body language. It's become commonplace. But in those days, it wasn't studied at all. And I, I pioneered that study and said, look, I'm a zoologist. I can't talk to other animals. I can only observe them and describe their actions. So I'm going to do the same thing with humans. Instead of interviewing people uh, in the way that other human scientists do, I'm going to watch people. I'm going to be an observer, a watcher, and I'm going to look at what people do. Uh, how, how do they use their hands? Uh, how do they use their facial expressions? Uh, what are their postures? And I, um, I found this really engrossing study. I'm still working on it now. I have now <coughs> just recently completed the first stage of my human ethogram. It's called an ethogram. That's the a list of every human action with, with a name. You see, we don't, uh, we don't have uh, names for many human actions, uh, which is rather interesting. If you, if you look at the dictionary, 
So very few of the human actions actually have a, a name. Uh, a wink has a name, uh, a, a shrug has a name, but there are a lot of other actions that don't have names. And so I have named every human action. And that's been one of my long-term goals. And it's been something that I've wanted to do. Uh, and I recently uh, decided I had to finish it off. And I've just sent that off to my scientific archive, which is at a, at a university. So that has been, to me, if you ask me which of all the, I've written nearly a hundred books. And if you ask me which one's my favorite, it is man, it's not Naked Ape, it's man watching because that was original. That was me making an entirely new study of human body language. And, and that is the thing that I'm, uh, in my scientific work, that's the thing that pleases me most. And, and that has become my scientific writing. That is my, my favorite book. Yeah, that's, I think, absolutely amazing because um, one thing uh, language uh, is missing is the, the ethogram where we can define all the actions because uh, uh, so since um, last time I interviewed uh, Franz de Waal, um, he basically uh, highlights this thing that the um, uh, why we use em emoticons because we don't have enough uh, words for our expressions. So we try to add some emoticons, uh, some emojis to to show what exactly our mood is. So I think, you know, having an ethogram probably will help a lot, uh, uh, you know, the Facebook people and Instagram people <laughs> to, to express our emotions more uh, broadly. Uh, but then also uh, about your observations that, that goes beyond this, which is, uh, which you mentioned in the, in Human Zoo where you say that the, of course, a lot of people, uh, which doesn't happen that a lot of different societies, uh, they are coming together now living in humans, like in big cities. So what what is a human zoo? And- uh, Yeah, well, this was the sequel. Uh, this was the sequel to Naked Ape. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, what I decided, when I moved to Maltusia, I was living on a small island and I was looking back at the time, I'd been living in London for many years in the center of a huge metropolis. And I thought, uh, people refer to the city as a concrete jungle. That was the phrase that was being used. The city is a concrete jungle. There's a film made of that title, I think. And I thought, it's not a jungle at all. It's much more like a zoo because people uh, keep animals in restricted environment in small cages uh, and in zoos and that's what happens to them in big cities so I thought let me look back at how this how has this happened and so I wrote the human zoo and the basis of what I was studying was that for a million years human beings had been tribal we lived in groups of no more than 80 to 120, small, tiny groups, uh, and there'll be neighboring tribes. Uh, and each tribe, you grew up in this tribe, and there were no strangers. You knew everybody in that tribe. Uh, and then as we developed our technologies and became more successful, and we introduced agriculture, so we had a food surplus for the first time. Uh, instead of being hunter gatherers, relying on gathering nuts and, and killing animals for our food, we now had food stores. And these food stores meant that uh, we could now develop larger communities. And as a, on the, because we were agriculturalists and had a sur food surplus, the tiny tribes became villages and the villages became towns and the towns became cities. And suddenly we were faced a few thousand years ago with the ancient civilizations uh, of, of Egypt and Greece and uh, all, all the other Middle Eastern civilizations. Uh, and, and of course also in, in ancient uh, Orient in China. And these ancient civilizations developed great cities, and as time passed, 
uh, the cities became all over the world became bigger and bigger and more and more crowded. And so I had to ask myself, what is the state of the human being who lives inside one of these big cities? He hasn't had time to evolve into the state that you find with a termite or an ant that lives in a huge colony. Um, he's still a tribal animal and he's living in this great city. And if you want to know how your what your tribe is all you have to do is say to somebody show me your phone book or your your address book and what's in your address book or your phone book that is your tribe these are the people you know they're friends colleagues uh, people who who work with you or that you you know for one reason or another and and if you count them up Somebody should do a study of this. I've never done it. But if you took everybody's, phone, of course, we don't have, we, we, now with electronics, it's changed. But in the old days, we'd all have a phone book or, or a, an address book. And if you took those and you counted up the number of addresses or number of phone numbers in a person's phone book, that would tell you that, the, the, and I guess it'd be between 1800 and 20, you know, which is the tribe that we evolved in. So. What's happened is that in the human zoo, in this great conglomeration of millions of people all living together, each one person is still a tribal person because they, they don't know all these people. You don't, as you're walking down the street in the city, you don't say, hello, hello to everybody. Oh, hello, how are you? You just walk past them. And so the ma vast majority of people in the city as you walk down the street, they're, they're non-people, they're not, they're, they're not friends. And you just walk past them and ignore them. They could just be a lamppost. <laughs> uh, um, and you, you learn to switch off. If you, you couldn't live otherwise. If, if everybody greeted everybody as a friend in the street, in the city, everything would grind to a halt. So what you do is you, you maintain your tribe of friends and colleagues in and relatives in, in a, uh, a group which is interlocked with all the tribes of all the other people. The, the, your friends and relatives don't all live together in, 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 geographically in one spot. You're scattered and some of you aren't even living in the city, you're living in, a, in a, another town or another village somewhere. So your tribe is now scattered and interlocked with all the other millions of tribes. In this way, this tribal animal, the human animal, can survive in a totally artificial, for, for humans, totally artificial situation, which is the urban world. The urban world is not what we were designed for. So what we do is we adapt. We, we, we retain our tribal behavior and, and we live with our friends and relatives inside that massive uh, conglomeration. We do not become like ants or termites. Uh, we, we, we keep our tribal character. And, <clears throat> and in that way, uh, we're honest to our origins. Uh, and that's how we managed to survive and, and in, in, the, in the human zoo, as I called it. And that was the, I, I, if I only spent a few minutes, but that was the essence of that book. Oh. Uh absolutely fascinating because um, I, w once i look at like the other uh, these huge brands i mean for example i don't know we can take an example of google right that when people say that i'm working in in google which is uh, basically pointing out at the same thing you know that we we belong to the same tribe uh, which probably now can be a bigger tribe than the the usual one um then um but but what do you think? How uh, strong our tribal urges are? Like how strong these urges can be, and like how how we can sort of overcome them? Are yes, there... uh, I, I know what you're saying. Uh, how, uh, because tribal feelings can be a problem, of course. Because yeah. uh, on the one hand, it means that we are helpful to one another within the tribe, but it also means that we can 
uh, be unhelpful to people outside the tribe. And <clears throat> so what we, what we have to do, and this is not easy for us, uh, and it's why we still have so much trouble in the world, is that we have to try to uh, not behave badly towards people outside our tribe. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you look after your friends and relatives and your children and your parents and so on. You, 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 you have loving care for them. Um, you can't have loving care for 7,000 million people. It's just not possible. But what you can do is to neutralize your negative feelings. That's a double negative. You can, uh, you can say to yourself, I have no right to be antagonistic towards these other people just because they're outside my tribe. If you go back to the primitive time, primeval times, when situation was good, you'd have small tribes living next door to one another and the relationship would be friendly. But if, if there was any sort of trouble uh, with the food supply or the environment or climate or whatever it was, any kind of disruption, and immediately you start getting tribal warfare between the tribes. Uh, and what happens is that whenever human beings are put under pressure, uh, this, this, this situation reasserts itself. And of course, when it's done at the urban level, it becomes warfare. And, and uh, we're, still, we're still threatened by that today, which we shouldn't be. We should have got over that now. Uh, and um, there, is, um, there is nothing at all to stop us from being friendly with people who are not members of our tribe. Uh, and we have to try and uh, control that aspect. But of course, it's not easy and we can repeatedly fail as, as I don't, you only have to switch on the television news to be really depressed about, about that aspect of humanity. Because uh, every television newscast pretty well has some nightmare story. But of course, what you have to, and people sometimes get depressed about this. And I have said to them, look, listen, you, 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 you must remember that what's on the news, a murder, uh, somebody being tortured, a, a war breaking out, these horrors are the exceptions because um, of the 7,000 million people you know, on, on the planet, the vast majority of them got up this morning and didn't hit anybody. <laughs> they got up this morning and they, they, they lived a peaceful day and passed a peaceful day without hurting anybody. But you only have to have a few hundred thousand of those doing something nasty and they're the ones that get the headlines. Headlines are always about the exceptions. And, and sometimes because the news headlines are always about some sort of awful human nightmare, one tends to think that that is the norm, but actually that is the exception because we are an amazingly successful species and an extraordinarily friendly one because um, people will say, what, the friendly? Look at, look at all the night. Yes, but those are the exceptions. Vast majority of people just simply want to get up, uh, have food, have, uh, do their work, have a bit of fun. They, they don't want all that mess, but it keeps re reappearing because, and there's a reason, we are now grossly overpopulated. That's the reason. Uh, any species, research has been done with, with animals, um, where they've been deliberately overpopulated in the laboratory to make them um, uh, stressed and to see what happens. And, and society breaks down, uh, animal society quickly breaks down if the population gets too high. And human beings uh, have now reached a level of overpopulation, which is alarming. Uh, and it's not only polluting the planet, it's also causing stress in, in human populations. And we don't seem to be able to control uh, our breeding. You see, <clears throat> if you are 
I don't know whether you know this, but if you're a mouse, house mouse, if you become overcrowded and you're a female, a pregnant female mouse, and there's some strange mice appear and you, you have the odor, of, it's mostly with odor rather than sight, but if there's a smell of strange mice in the house, a pregnant female mouse reabsorbs her embryos. She actually reabsorbs her embryos. Now, what an extraordinary mechanism. Um, <laughs> if that happened in cities, there'd be no children at all. If human beings were like mice, <clears throat> the crowding in, in cities is such that uh, if a pregnant woman, uh, if she, if she uh, detected a stranger, she would absorb her embryo. You see, well, now we don't have that mechanism. <clears throat> it's different in different species. With foxes, um, what happens is if they're overcrowded, uh, the vixens, the female foxes, uh, simply don't come on to heat. They don't, they don't reproduce. Um, and then that stops the population getting overcrowded. And most, most species do have a, a mechanism that prevents overpopulation. We don't seem to have got, we're a very young species. Uh, in, term, in geological terms, very young. And we haven't yet developed a population control system like the house mouse or the fox. <laughs> uh, and so um, our population is growing. I, I think, I forget the figures now, don't, I, 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 do, I, I should know them, but I've forgotten them. I think it's something like 140,000 people a day more on the planet, or so I don't know. Don't don't quote me on that figure, but the, but it, it is it is a large figure. Every day, the human population increases, and it's been doing so now uh, for thousands of years. Uh, we we're, we're too successful for our own good. That's our trouble. We're so successful um, because our, our great achievements in technology, thanks to our scientific inventiveness has led to conditions that uh, uh, permit populations to, to grow and grow and grow. And uh, eventually um, it will be our undoing. It may take another thousand years, but eventually if we don't stop, we will, we will literally um, pollute the planet. And uh, yeah. it's interesting that now, even at this stage, <clears throat> Um, people are beginning to worry about this. Uh, this is new. Um, 30, 40 years ago, nobody bothered about uh, the planet being polluted. Uh, and today, this is, I'm, I'm, it's, it's wonderful. That young people particularly are now very concerned about this because they see the dangers. Uh, and I've been aware of this for a long time. I made I did a one hour television program about it in 19, 65, I think it was. Nobody listened, nobody took any notice. <laughs> but uh, I've been concerned about this for a long time. And um, uh, nowadays you have to see a, uh, uh, some poor dolphin wrapped up in plastic bags for people to get upset. But uh, I've always spent a lot of time in the ocean when I was younger. Uh, and I always had on my wrist I would always have a thermometer. So many, many years ago, I, 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 I said, that's funny. The sea's too warm. It shouldn't be this warm. Uh, and I was starting to get worried about it long before anybody else had even noticed it. And I thought, why is the sea getting warmer? Um, and then I noticed that the corals were bleaching. And uh, if you go to the Seychelles, the corals are all bleached, they're all dead from overheating. You go a bit further south to Mauritius and they're not, they're all beautifully colored. So it was, it was uh, but then I discovered that the whole of the Caribbean, all, all the corals there are bleached. Uh, it's, it's frightening. Uh, if you study marine life, you know that there is this rise in temperature. Now this I was aware of, well, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and nobody seemed to be interested, but I'm very pleased that now, today, young people are became, becoming aware of this and are aware of the problem um, uh, and, and that people are 
considering the damage that we're doing to the to the planet uh, what i don't want to see happen well i shall because i shan't be here much longer but but in a few a few thousand years time i don't want humanity to end up as the mold on a rotting planet that would be terrible and i hope we can do something about it yes um, i mean definitely climate change is one of the big issues um but i mean yes the i think the the key factors uh, which are there one is education that still people need to understand um what we are doing to the planet the things that we are using so in in many ways uh, this education is important and about the population that you mentioned um gender equality is is one uh, major concern which uh, still we are here there depending upon different regions of the world um and you have those uh, interesting explanations about gender roles in the society um especially in humans that the um the sort of uh, jobs uh, that human males are, are doing and the sort of jobs that human females are doing which basically should have been the other way around uh, maybe you can uh, maybe we can talk about this a little bit yes um, okay uh, this is an important point because yeah um again you see i always go back to the human tribe Uh, primeval tribe because we evolved in that tribal condition for a million years so that's where our character was formed uh, you can't a species can't form a character in a few thousand years um but over the million years when we were small living in small tribes uh, that was where the male character and the female character were developed and what happened was this the tribe was so small that the females were too precious to risk on the hunt because they had to produce the offspring otherwise the species would disappear and so the males became the hunters uh because they were compared with the females they were expendable you could lose a few males but uh, from a from a small group of 100 people but you couldn't lose a few females because you couldn't you couldn't uh, risk losing uh, the childbearing units uh, to put it in a scientific sense um the um the males who dis- who went off to hunt for animals which was a new development for us uh had to develop a new character um uh, she most monkeys and apes when they're faced with danger they they run away they they climb up in the trees uh if there's a leopard coming you climb up in the trees you don't try and fight it what the human hunter had to do uh, had to evolve was um uh, risk taking um he had to be prepared to take a risk in a way that other primates didn't do and this risk taking became something very important for the human male um uh, it's stayed with us ever since and it underlies the difference the real difference between men and women is that uh the men are the risk takers and the male gender is is more inclined to take risks than the female gender uh, when i say this let me say that there are always going to be some women who are risk takers and some men who are not i mean it, it isn't a, it's not black and white it, it's just a bias there's a slight bias but if you are a human male you are more likely to take risks on average than if you're human female and this is why activities that we perform today which involve risk taking uh are, are more likely to be performed by males historically um the human female uh was much more concerned you see when the males went off hunting the females ran society they were at the heart of the tri- they were in the settlement because we had a tribal settlement and and the males had to go off hunting and bring bring back the the kill but the females were at the uh, the center there they they dealt with virtually every aspect of society other than hunting so they were of major importance in tribal society and 
what was so sad, we talked to earlier about urbanization and about the development of cities. And what is so sad was that when that happened, uh, women got a raw deal uh, because what, if you stop to think about it, the men who used to go off hunting were on the periphery and the women were at the center of society doing everything except hunting, organizing the whole thing and uh, tremendously important. But when the city developed, the hunting was brought into the center of society because now you went, you, 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 you looked for, you went hunting for a contract or, or a business deal. And suddenly the men, instead of being up on the periphery, were now in the center of society, in the center of the city, doing all the business deals and organizing this uh, society. And the women lost out. They were now pushed out into the suburbs and made into uh, child bearers. And this was grotesquely unfair to women because they had originally been the, the center of society in organizing it. Um, and what has happened is that in different parts of the world, as you, I think you mentioned this earlier, in different parts of the world, this differentiation between men and women has varied enormously. So in, in, in one culture, women are still treated in that old fashioned way as, as a, a childbearing piece of property. And then in, in another culture now, they're now at long last, they've got their equality back. Actually, uh, when the feminist movement began, somebody said to me, as a zoologist, how do you look upon feminists? And I said, well, they're not asking for something, they think they're asking for something new, they're not. What they're asking for is their birthright back. What they're asking for is to get back their social significance, which was central to a tribal society. And I'm on record, as I've been in trouble for this, I've been on record as saying that no politician should be male, all politicians should be female, because organizing society should be in the hands of women who don't take stupid risks. Now, the word stupid I've introduced there, which you see, because if you're hunting, you have to take risks. Uh, and if you're an inventor, you have to take risks. Most inventions are made by male, by the way. Uh, and and, and uh, men and women can invent, but women don't. It's a male. If you look, you, if you go to the patent's office and ask how many inventions were made by men and by women, the vast majority were made by men because that's risk taking. The so inventiveness is risk taking. Um, and the whole point is that women who had always organized tribal society should be in charge of organizing urban society, but they have had a raw deal now for thousands of years. And in some countries, they're still getting a raw deal. But the, um, in the West, thank goodness, now they're getting their equality. They get the feminist movement was, without realizing it, they were asking for their biological birthright back, which had been taken away from them. So that in the West is a great advance. And uh, um, it, it, it allows uh, men and women to share uh, social, uh, the social structure. But I must emphasize that when I talk like this, um, it's only a slight bias. Uh, out of every hundred men, and every, if you have a hundred men, hundred women, you'll find 10 of those women will be more masculine than 10 of the men. You know, there, there's an overlap. Uh, so that is why you can have great sports women because uh, sport involves taking risks, but uh, there are always going to be enough women who have a strong enough urge to take risks to make great sportswomen. Uh, so there the, the will never, you can't, it's not, a, it's not a matter of male and female, black and white. It, it, is, it is an overlap. There's just a slight bias difference, that's all. Uh, and the only way to honor our biology is, is to have uh, a balance between the sexes. Yes, and when you say that the feminists have got, gotten their uh, birthright, um, that means that somehow through culturally we were suppressing their rights, you know? Um, so the, 
the question is then how far these this arms race between culture cultural developments and uh, biology it can go because uh, clearly that means either at one point i mean for example the the race which is go or this another movement which is going on uh, which is from lgbtq community so uh, which of course i think once it goes on uh, they will also win it uh, but that that means that how how far we we can go with these this arms race between cultural developments and biology uh, uh, how far can we go with with uh, th this arms race between uh, cultural developments and uh, biology you know? well uh, the, the point is that any society that honors uh, our biological characteristics will be more successful. Um, one of the great weaknesses of the communists, uh, who, who are no longer uh, as powerful as they used to be, uh, but one of the great weaknesses that, uh, of the communist uh, philosophy was that people should not be allowed to own personal property. Um, that was the rule. You couldn't have personal property. Um, and, of course, owning personal property is, is primeval with human beings. The settlement is made up of little huts and, and, and uh, homes where people lived. And you, um, it, is, it is part of human nature to have a home and possessions and and a family unit that that is that has been going on for a million years, and if you try to get rid of that, uh, you'll you'll find that it will eventually cause trouble. You you can force all sorts of things onto people. Uh, tyrants can can through instilling fear can force people to do things that are not part of their biological nature, but. It never lasts. It can't last because ultimately the biological nature will win through. It it may have trouble doing so, but it will win through. And and so uh, I have every confidence that as time goes on, um, the uh, equality of the sexes will be recognised, uh, and that um, the extreme forms of uh, subjugation that we've seen in some cultures will disappear. I, I just don't think it will uh, will succeed because it, it it goes against human nature, and and I think human nature will always, uh, in the end, win through. But because we and so you might say, well, why isn't it? Why is it having all this trouble? Well, and I already the answer is because we're in artificially overcrowded populations where. Um, we, we're, we're living in, in, in social conditions which are artificial to our species and, and that is one of our problems that we have to resolve and we have to use our ingenuity and our intelligence to resolve it. Yes, um, and now maybe we can also uh, talk about your uh, other part of the brain, uh, which is the artistic brain. And I think that the, uh, the, the key start would be uh, Congo, the the artist, uh, the the chimpanzee that you knew, yeah. that uh, who who drew like for for quite a while, and I think you you were quite uh, inspired by him. Um, well, what happened was, you see, I've been painting. I've always painted. Even uh, my public life has always been that of a, a, a on television or or as a scientist. But my private life has always been that of an artist. I've always had a studio. Where, where no matter how busy I've been, I've always made time to get to my studio, uh, some years more than others. Um, and I've, I've now painted, I did count it up the other day, it's, uh, it's 3,400 paintings uh, approximately. Um, and uh, occasionally, uh, my, the two sides of my life have, have connected. And when I had a chimpanzee, I thought, well, I wonder whether a chimpanzee is capable of making patterns on a piece of paper. And I started experimenting with this chimpanzee and he was, he was able to organize his lines so that uh, the position of the lines was not random. 
you, you, um, you know, if you if you looked at his work, you you could see that there was some structure in the pattern. He never developed uh, imagery, but he was able to make abstract designs and to vary them and to develop them. And so, to me, this was the birth of art. This was the, you could see that even in the chimpanzee brain. Uh, there was an urge to make images, and he really enjoyed this. He he, um, he didn't look on it as a chore. In fact, if I tried to, if I, for some reason I had to go somewhere and I had to stop him in the middle of a painting, he would have a temper tantrum and become angry, and, and would would be very uh, upset if if he couldn't finish a painting. Also, if I tried to get him to go on when he'd finished a painting, he wouldn't. He he knew when he'd finished it. Um, so he knew how to fill a space, he knew when to stop, and, and uh, was uh, somebody referred to the paintings in Lascaux as the birth of art. <laughs> Congo was the birth of art, Lascaux was the adolescence, because um, already if you look at, uh, I always remember the first time I walked into Lascaux when it had just been opened, these magnificent paintings have been done by Ice Age people uh, under the most primitive conditions, technically. And I just couldn't understand how they did it. And I, I was uh, astonished at the artistic ability of these people. And, and I've since made a detailed study of prehistoric art. And I wrote a book called The Artistic Ape because I, I, I said, the human species has got one very special quality, and that is uh, we, uh, we love making artistic objects. We love uh, creating images. And uh, so I, I made a whole study of that. But for me personally, uh, what happened was that back in 1947, I I started to develop a personal private world in my painting. My paintings are not, not easy for most people to understand. They are very private paintings and I don't expect anybody else to understand them. I, I, when I write a book, I write for everybody else. I don't write for myself. When I paint a picture, I paint for myself. Uh, and if other people enjoy it, that's fine. But that's not my motivation. Um, uh, I, I paint because I'm exploring new shapes, new images, um, I'm trying to evolve on canvas my own flora and fauna, my own uh, biological world, and I call them biomorphs, uh, these images. Um, where are we? Uh, I think I've got, oh yes, oh, you can see one of them here on the cover of this book. You see. Yes. Um, uh, that is uh, one of my biomorphic images, which is on the cover of uh, a new book that's just come out. And uh, this word, private world has developed, let's say, over, uh, well, since, since the 1940s. And I'm still working on it today. I still, and, and the, the essence of it is that when I sit down at my canvas, I try to let my, I, I don't analyze, I don't do preliminary drawings. I just simply sit there and I let the painting develop and grow. And I allow my unconscious mind to operate, which is what the surrealists did, and I'm, I'm, I think I'm now the last living surrealist, and pretty well of the of the people who were active during the movement. Yeah, uh, I think we've been going over one hour already. Maybe we can take a few more questions, uh, and then uh, we can let you go. Okay. Uh, so, the 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 next question is about uh, the your your art, which is the trap. Uh, which is basically you drew, I think, in 1948, uh, somewhere around 1948, which was your first artwork. And recently it was rediscovered and uh, um, sort of uh, published again. Uh, can, we, can, can we talk about it? The, the, the trap, which you uh, basically drew, I think, in... Oh, the uh, trap. Oh, that trap. Yes, yes. I, it, it was a gift. I gave it to my publisher, publisher who produced Naked Ape. I gave it to him as a gift, and he um, he died recently, and so now it's been auctioned. And uh, uh, 
gallery that shows my paintings in London bought it. Um, the Trap, yes. Well, uh, I, uh, do I have an image? I can't get an Im image quickly enough for you, but I have it here somewhere. But it's, uh, um, yes, the, when I paint my biomorphic shapes, I try to introduce some sort of drama, some sort of interaction between them. So in this case, there's a creature that is being trapped. It's a biomorphic, it's not a natural creature, it's a biomorphic creature, but um, uh, I didn't, uh, I was always painting for myself. And then what happened was that <coughs> I used to give my paintings away when I was young, because I couldn't keep them. And some of those started to come up at Sotheby's. There it is. Sorry? Have we lost our connection? Yes. No. Oh, uh, there, oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. I oh, remember. yes, fantastic. There's the trap. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> As you can see, there's a there's a uh, a strange creature there, uh, which is approach. Oh, and there's another one. Oh, you've got some of my paintings here. There's yes. another biomorphic figure. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, the 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 early work is now starting to come up at auction again, and. Uh, um, it's uh, it's always a shock to see paintings that I did because of course the person who painted that in 1940s was a, was not me it was a different person uh, <laughs> I, I I look at them now as if it's somebody else's work because of course um, that, that's what 70 years ago it is um, I'm very lucky to be able to still write and paint at the age of 93 I. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I don't, ha I have a studio next door to my study. I'm in my study now, next door is my studio. I've always had a study for writing in a studio for painting and I still have that arrangement and we'll keep doing it as, as long as I can. I don't, there won't be much longer. Although I have promised to make a parachute jump on my hundredth birthday with my grandchildren. They have persuaded me, they, mm -hmm. they like, my grandchildren love jumping out of airplanes, parachutes. And they persuaded me to join them to celebrate my hundredth birthday. So <laughs> if I live that long, uh, I shall be floating down through the air somewhere. And well, our hope is uh, with you anyway. So <laughs> we want to see that picture that you yeah. find. And... <laughs> yeah. Well, at least if I die before then, at least I can say to myself, well, thank God I didn't have to do that. <laughs> It'll make dying a little easier. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you if you have since you have uh, this much energy, I think you can easily do it. Probably will have a uh, trouble with the uh, with jumping from the plane. Well, a, a friend of mine who's a, a brain surgeon, uh, he says the whole point about the human brain is that if you if you don't use it, you lose it. And I've never stopped using my brain. I'm still working till four a.m. Uh, well, not last night. I went to bed early, about two thirty. But I work very late at night, writing or painting, and I think it is that that's kept my brain going. Unfortunately, uh, Mother Nature has a recycling plan, and uh, and I'm part of that. And so my body will shortly be recycled, which is rather unfortunate because my brain doesn't really want that to happen. Uh, so I still have a young brain, but my body is obviously aging, and I'm I'm now. Uh, feeling the pangs of old age, but uh, my advice to anybody who is, is uh, getting old is never ever retire. That's the worst thing you can do. Um, uh, always keep active uh, and never stop asking questions. Yes, um, you may lose your body, but you are staying here. So you have transferred uh, so many questions, uh, so many uh, of your uh, work and study which you have shared with uh, the, the humanity, I think they will be with us anyway. Um, the, the last question that I have uh, yeah. before, uh, I'll, before we let you go is, what is the secret of longer life? Secret of long life? Yes. Um, I think it's important to... Uh, to enjoy life, uh, if you, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to say this, but um, see, there are people who, I've never, I've never in my life indulged in things like gymnastics or 
uh, jogging or health foods. I don't do any of that, never have. Um, and somebody said, yes, but if you went jogging and you, you ate health foods, you'd be healthier. And I said, well, the problem you see is that when you do those things, they are a result of anxiety. You're anxious about, anxious about your health. And your anxiety makes you go jogging or, or do gymnastics uh, or, or, or eat health foods or eat food that you don't like because you think, oh, well, that's good for me. I always say eat the food you like because that, if you enjoy your meal, uh, it'll do much more good for you than, than if you eat what you think is healthy. Um, and, and there's a reason, I'm, I, this sounds nonsensical, but there is a reason behind this. You see, when we are anxious, it reduces the efficiency of our immune system. This is the serious bit. <laughs> and the immune system is crucially important. Uh, it's our defense, it's our body's defense against ill, all, all kinds of ills, mental and physical. And what we need is a, a powerful, uh, a very strong uh, immune system. And the more anxious you are about your health, uh, the less, uh, th that actually uh, uh, reduces the efficiency of your immune system, so it doesn't work. Uh, so my advice to prolong life is to enjoy that, enjoy your food. Uh, don't worry about health food. Uh, don't worry about having to take exercise. If you, I, lose, I used to love walking. I love long walk. If every time I went to a new city, I would go on a long walk. That's fine, you know, because I was exploring the city. I wasn't taking an. Ex I wasn't taking exercise. I was exploring the city. There's a difference. Uh, so my advice to you is is to. Uh, explore the world, never stop asking questions and enjoy life. And, and, and that's your best chance of keeping your immune system happy. <laughs> and that's what sure. really, really matters. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience, if we can uh, take it, um, or maybe one question, basically. So, Anna, maybe you can ask your question. Anna Papagiorgio. Yes. From Greece. Hi. Or, or exactly. Cyprus. Greece or Cyprus? From, from Greece. So okay. thank you both for this like fruitful discussion, interview. I have basically two questions if I could like ask. Um, so the first is like more, um, we know that our behavior is like made up of somehow a chaotic soup of different factors. From one part, we know about inherited traits, and then we know about like epigenetics, like this gene environment interactions, right? Uh, but do you feel there might be something more that hasn't been like scientifically defined yet that may contribute to animal to, to the animal behavior or to our uh, behavior? Um, I'm not. I, 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 I'm be honest. I don't quite understand you asking uh, if there's something. Uh, I, could you put the question a different way? Mm. Yeah, be, because mainly. Uh, like we know that our behavior is mainly affected by like inherited traits, right? Like genes, but also about it, like it's affected uh, from like epigenetics, how like our genes interact with the environment, right? But since like we were observing uh, uh, like various animals, do you feel that there might be something that we haven't like, like the scientific community hasn't like uh, defined yet, so something that hasn't discovered yet, for example, couple of years back, we didn't know about epigenetics, right? Yeah. So can oh. you see that now, today, yeah. we don't know like about something that like in a few years, you speculate that can emerge in this, like this is my- yeah, I, I've got to, I've got to, but thank you. Now I understand that. Um, I think there are always going to be new things to be discovered. That's what's so exciting. I mean, I, um, every day I, I have a new question uh, that I can't answer. And um, I'm always excited when something happens that I, I can't explain uh, because it immediately makes me want to find an explanation for it. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced that there are a number of aspects of our behavior that 
we haven't even really approached yet and which we, we, we don't understand. I think what, what's so important is to keep our minds uh, open to new ideas. Uh, because if you stop to think about it, um, I mean, the, I've got one of these things here, oh, this. Now, I mean, this, if I'd shown this to my grandfather, he'd, he'd have had a, a, a terrible shock. And, and if you try to explain television to your great grandfather, he said, don't be silly, you can't do that. Um, technology is constantly developing. And I was asked recently, what, and I think this is the basis of your question, what are the new areas that we, we could develop in? And I'll give you just one example uh, of, of something that really puzzles me, something that I do not understand, and that is gravity. When I walk outside the house, why don't I float off into the sky? Why, why, why do I stay on the surface of the planet? Why don't I just drift off? And I asked a physicist this once, I had to get him drunk first, because physicists don't like talking about it. When I gave him a few drinks, this physicist, a professor of physics, admitted to me, he said, we really do not understand gravity. And I said, well, that's fantastic, that's marvelous. It's something, a wonderful new thing to be discovered because once we have understood gravity so that we can build anti-gravity machines, the wheel will become obsolete. Now, the wheel was a great invention. I mean, our, my primeval tribal people didn't have wheels. They didn't understand a wheel, they didn't know I had a concept of a wheel. A wheel was brilliant human invention and it changed our lives. And the next big technological jump is going to be anti-gravity. Uh, they're working on it, they're working on it, I'm told. Because when I mentioned this somewhere, somebody wrote, said, we're working on it. <laughs> and, um, and if we have got anti-gravity machines so that we can just you know, hop in a car and float off somewhere. We don't have to keep on the, on, on the, on the surface anymore. That would totally, totally change the structure of human society. And uh, we will once again be faced with an entirely new problem of human behavior, of how we respond to this. Um, and then of course, that's, that's one, one example of a new development, things we don't know about. And another one, which is even more controversial, is time travel. So I, 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 I think eventually, maybe it take a thousand years, but I think eventually we will uh, conquer time travel. And that is going to be exciting as well, because it will enable us to explore the cosmos. And, and uh, it, 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 these are things that today are just science fiction, you know, but as I said, my great grandfather would have looked upon television as science fiction. Um, and um, you've got to remember that when I was a child, there was no time. I was, I was a child before television happened. Um, and uh, I remember the arrival of radio and then television and telephones. And these are all newfangled things, which are wonderful. So we are, we are going to move into new phase of humanity when things, um, you know, we, people tend to think of small developments, but these are big developments. If we can, if we can, do, if we can defeat gravity, if we can control gravity, if we can uh, in, uh, develop time traveling devices, then this is, these are going to be major changes in our species. So I'm very optimistic for the future because we are so ingenious. And as I say, this, is something which we take for granted today. But uh, if you'd show me that when I was a child in the 1930s, I, I just said, I don't believe it. It's science fiction. <laughs> um, now, I, I'm not sure. I think your question may have been more about philosophy than technology. <laughs> uh, but I've tried to answer it in, in relation to technology. Um, um, Philosophically, of course, uh, 
changes in our behavior, uh, we, we, we are constantly rethinking attitudes to everything. And that is very healthy. The most unhealthy thing is when you have suppression of uh, exploration, uh, suppression of freedom of ideas. And uh, we are seeing that in some countries. Uh, and and it, it, it is a great shame when, when uh, people in power restrict the amount of inventiveness and art, uh, artistic development and, and, and technological development. Because as a human species, the two things that we have supremely achieved are our technology and our art. Uh, the, the art. When I say art, I'm talking about music and poetry and painting and sculpture, the whole realm of the arts. That's one of our greatest achievements. Uh, and the other is our technology, our science and our technology. And um, those two aspects of our life, which have concerned me all my life, I, to me, they're the most important. And uh, what the biggest difficulty is that tyrants keep re resurfacing and, and interfering with what should be a kind of childlike curiosity, because that's what makes us great as a species is our, our childlike curiosity and our, our joy of exploring new ideas. Um, and I think that, uh, but I'm, I'm I'm an optimist. I think I think eventually all tyrants die, and we will eventually uh, allow our brains to uh, nourish us as a species. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, last question from Dr. Julie from India. If if you can please ask your question. Uh, am I audible now? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, so I wanted to ask Dr. Morris, first of all, thank you so much for such a nice session, but I missed uh, half of it. But still my question is a little off the topic, but still I want to ask it from you because you are so experienced and everything. So I'm first I would like to tell you a bit about myself that I'm in my 30s and I haven't found a life partner so i'm just thinking that not having a life partner can it have some uh, you know bad or good psychological effect or physiological effect on my body because being an indian it's not simple like the moment uh, my my parents and my relatives they all are like after this thing that oh you're a girl you should get married but I'm happy this way as well. So I just want to know that what's, what do you, what do you, what do you tell me? What can you suggest me about this? Uh, if I understand, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at my age, I'm getting a little deaf, so you must forgive me. But uh, if I understand the question, it's uh, that uh, the caller said that she uh, does not have a life partner. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, and that she's worried about whether this is a problem. Um, the, the wonderful thing about uh, being a human being is that you do have choices. Um, you, uh, you can, uh, as a uh, solitary individual, um, and there'd be many great solitary individuals in history, uh, you can um, compensate. If you're a human being, you, you compensate for the loss of one thing with something else. Now, in the case of uh, somebody living a solitary life without a family life, the, the disadvantage is that you, you can't satisfy your uh, urges to be part of a family, but the advantage is that you don't have to waste any time on anybody else and you have more time to yourself and you can use that time creatively uh, and and some great artists have been very solitary uh, uh, and and uh, the, the point is that uh, 
what you lose in terms of family relationships, uh, you can gain in terms of time available for doing what you really want to do, whatever that might be, whether it's writing or painting or uh, traveling or whatever, whatever appeals to you, whatever you, you find yourself happy doing. And I think the, the, the essence of, of one of the values of, of modern life is that you do have choices in this way. Um, and uh, you're not forced to belong to a, a group in, in one, this way or that way. And, and you have your choices and, and there are always compensations, as I say. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, with that, I should thank you as well. Thank you for joining today, uh, uh, for sharing your experience. Um, and you are uh, truly an artist for me, I think for all of us, um, of life and uh, of course, of the art as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, thank you everyone else for joining. So, uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I'm sorry if I've gone on too long. <laughs> uh, no, I think it was, uh, I think probably it's my mistake that the, <laughs> we went too, too, too far with this. No, that's fine. Um, anyway, yeah. thank you so much. And I've enjoyed talking. Perfect. Bye. Yes. Bye.